definitely a Chrysoporcha. It is. Those are some of the most beautiful corals. Zoom in. Oops, sorry. There's such tiny polyps on this mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. And that's a that's another one of our target shrimps that is oh, yeah. swimming in the background. Oh nice. Just teasing you there, Bob. Look at them. It could probably be the same <laughs> one that is uh, following us around. <laughs> I think. <laughs> <laughs> He's been hitching a ride the whole time, or it's been, <laughs> <laughs> it's been hitching a ride this whole time. Our little friend. So if I remember correctly with Metallic Gorgia, that's named in part due to a sort of metallic appearance to its uh, stalk. The, well, the skeleton of these are, are just, the, it's actually why they're called the gold corals in the South Pacific. Um, if you ever look at one of their, um, uh, like, field guides, they'll call these gold corals. And it's, um, one, they, they, are, they do have these beautiful, oh, yeah, that might be another those one jellies. of those jellies. They are, they are stunning, and they're, you know, so precious in, in that way. But they're, the skeleton of them, it has this sort of, metallic oil sheen gold color yeah to them. it's absolutely stunning it's like uh, is that just a trick of yeah. refraction in the material or is there actually a little bit of metal that it's incorporating somehow you know i'm, I'm not positive actually i know that um you know there's multiple jellies yeah it looks there. like there's that a jelly one, there's a couple in there one. and there's a sh i saw a shrimp i think back yeah. in i think there that's a shrimp well. yeah that is a shrimp. yeah all sorts of associates on this one yeah, Some of which are predatory. Okay, Scott says no metal in the skeleton that he's aware of. Yeah, so, no. Yeah, I mean, it's a refraction thing. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah, again, trying to probe those questions about what's the relationship between, uh, you know, what's what's in the rocks and uh, uh, some of the some of the species that we're seeing, and whether or not there are some other interactions that uh, uh, some other interactions to consider there. But yeah, that, that could just. You know, it's, it's easy to make things look metallic uh, with the right kind of refractive structure in the skeleton, too. Mm -hmm. I've seen a couple of lab specimens of metallogorgia before, and they do have some really, really striking uh, luster to them. And it really does look like there could be metal in there, but... Um, that would be a very interesting thing to concentrate up to that level in a skeleton anyway so yeah uh, refraction seems like the uh, the likelier thing oh shoot While we're cruising along here, I'd, I'd love to know, you know, one of the things that, that we uh, practice in the voyaging community and that's part of a lot of our expeditions is, and learning is bringing our teachers uh, into our spaces, into our expeditions, uh, bringing our kumu, mm -hmm. our sources, Hawaiian word for teacher or source. And uh, I'm curious about uh, some of the teachers we've had in this room that we'd like to bring into the control van with us. Uh, some of the people we've learned a lot from, uh, maybe brought us into the field. Uh, yeah, does anyone have any have a have a teacher that they'd want to uh, they want to bring into the control van with us on this dive? From like any era of our educations? Any era, absolutely any era. Oh man, I had this awesome science teacher in seventh and eighth grade, and she you know she made science really hands on and really fun for us, but also like really held standards high, just like you would um, in research. And it was a challenge, you know, especially especially with me as, you know, relatively immature 11, 12 year old, mm -hmm. trying, trying to handle that. And uh, I, I took so much away from that class and I'm pretty sure that had a big influence. So uh, her name is Mrs. Sparling uh, mm -hmm. over at uh, uh, the Grand Blank School System in Michigan. And uh, yeah, she was wonderful. 
got to meet up with her a few years back. Uh, and she was just kind of blown away in the direction that I seem to be heading in. Yeah, it would be cool to share that with her. Oh, Mrs. Sparling. Mahalo. Mahalo for uh, inspiring Val in the way that you did, because it's an honor to be sitting next to Val and, and mm -hmm. by extension you. <laughs> so, thank you, Val, for sharing that. I love hearing about people's teachers. Anyone in the front row have a teacher that they uh, that they want to bring in, bring in with them? I mean, actually, someone that came to mind. Not she was uh, not a personal teacher of mine. I wish, but she's kind of a source of knowledge to me and inspiration. Is um, the incredible author and oceanographer Rachel Carson. Oh, um, Rachel Carson. Her, her cool. book, The Sea Around Us, really. I've been thinking a lot about it on this cruise. It's just it's coming to life in what we're seeing here. Um, I love that so much. That yeah, book. I think of it, it's kind of like a, it's an oceanography textbook, but written in a way that's almost lyrical, so. Oh, that's wow. Right. That's right. I highly recommend the book if you if you have not read The Sea Around Us or any of Rachel Carson's work or are unfamiliar with all that she contributed to, um, to conservation of, of the ocean environment, also um, near shore aquatic ecosystems and wetlands. She's just a, um, such a, well, such a gem and uh, really sparked a lot of the modern environmental movement. So such mm -hmm. a hero. That's a great one to bring in. Thank you, mm -hmm. Catalina. Oh, this is so... Yeah, you know, I had a, um, I had a undergraduate professor in ecology. Uh, I probably, I probably would have continued into fishery studies if I, uh, if I hadn't had this, this <laughs> professor who talked about you know, looking at patterns that you see, like the rocks, and then and then seeing, you know, the the distribution of animals. And this was in an intertidal zone, so one of the first times we looked at this was actually with uh, snails growing in the wedges, or not growing, but like, you know, you would see this pattern of snails being in sort of wedges of rocks, you know, on these rocky intertidal zones, and you'd just be like, oh, weird, why is that? And then he's like, well, think about, you're seeing this pattern, What's the process? And the process is dehydration, really. You know, oh. it's the fact that that crevice has a little bit more water in it and it holds more water. And so when it's a high tide, those snails can actually, you know, stay in that. And that's the, that's the mechanism. The mechanism is, you know, um, sort of tidal processes and, and, you know, where water rests in these rocks. It's, and so thinking about those you know, you see patterns every day around you, but it's thinking about one step more. Why do we see those patterns? Yeah, and that really cool. ignited um, an interest in, in studying the whys. And so it's, uh, yeah, and he's, he's an amazing ecologist. He studies um, tropical coral reefs, actually. It's, awesome. er, yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, and it's, it's pretty amazing, the work that he's done. Um, yeah, so it would be, It'd be really cool to to just sit when and just talk with him about this because he you know he's got so much information yeah oh, i love that it's always fantastic when a teacher mm -hmm. great teachers just invite us to go deeper right they hold right. us to that deeper sometimes maybe deeper standard since we're going into the deep sea we can uh, <laughs> we often think of it as a higher standard but really it's all about continuing to probe continuing to ask questions inviting us into that space where it's safe enough to do so but challenging so challenging to uh to continue the pursuit of understanding the whys behind what we see happening those patterns are so precious reminds me of uh, a teacher i'll bring in her name's uh, dr dana baumeister and uh, she is the the creator and the lead the lead professor in the master's program i did um, in biomimicry innovation inspired by nature and um, dana is really a leader in the field of biomimicry and, and similar uh, has just done so much to invite me to to look more closely, um, to pay attention to um, pay attention to the patterns and try to figure them out, try to puzzle them out, understand why they're happening, and and how we can apply those lessons from nature um, to our own lives um, as human beings, and uh, so that we can reconnect and kind of thrive thrive again. So, mahalo to mahalo to Dana and. Uh, yeah, hopefully she'll get a chance to tune in. I know she loves the ocean. She's lived in Montana. She got her PhD studying pine forests, um, but she's uh, she's really an ocean an ocean woman at heart. So 
I know she'll be excited by this. Yeah, that's awesome. So one of our uh, scientists ashore, Scott, says that he had a biology teacher when he was a senior in high school uh, who was really influential on his career choice. Uh, and this teacher, uh, Bob Malik, Malik, uh, sorry if I'm mispronouncing that, um, that used to run these uh, annual week-long field trips to Rhode Island. And uh, uh, th there they got to interact with uh, scientists at the EPA and grad students at University of uh, Rhode Island at the Graduate School of Oceanography there. And he says that that was, uh, that was pretty memorable and that uh, he's very lucky to have that teacher, and not just as a teacher, but as a friend. Oh, awesome. Uh, Malik. Thanks, Scott. Bob Malik. Mr. Malik, thank you. Probably, probably Dr. Malik. Yeah, <laughs> Dr. Malik, thank you. Uh, That's funny. The uh, the the researcher I was thinking of was a, was also a Bob, but uh, Bob Sinek, yeah. Well, so Bobs are are some of the greatest teachers out there. I, uh, <laughs> Indeed, mm -hmm. we got one right in the control van with us yeah, too. Right in the front row. <laughs> Robert, where'd you learn where'd you learn all your all your knowledge and skill from? Who who taught you all these secrets? <laughs> my, my background's electronics. Uh, I think the thing that really got me into it was my father bought me a thousand and one electronics kit when I was a kid. I love it. And, nice. Uh, and I did every single one of those. <laughs> He thought, "Oh, this will keep yeah. this will keep Robert busy for a while." He probably went through those in a week. He's like, "Oh no!" <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Awesome the ways we're shaped by the just those little invitations, presentations of uh, opportunities to expand our curiosity, and uh, you know, fun to think about the ways that they've they've brought us to where we are now. Definitely. 14, 1,400 meters, just under 1,400 meters deep at the uh, Loudon Sea Mount in Papahanaumokuakea. We got time for more Kumu. We got time. Mm -hmm. uh, I had, um, is it okay if I shout out a couple Kumu? Of Please, my do it. Um, so the very first Kumu I had that inspired me um, to do, to get into the realm of ocean science, um, she wasn't really my my teacher per se, but she's my cousin. Um, she's the first one that um, kind of showed us around her lab. She works up in um, Juneau, Alaska, Dr. Kale um, Shotwell Henselman. And so she works at NOAA, so she was the one that inspired me to go into this, this field of um, marine science. And then um, when I got into my undergrad, I also had an amazing teacher, uh, Dr. John Burns, who really inspired us that science doesn't always have to right be down the so... So um, strict and um, to the point, but like you can also have fun with science. And he was one of the first teachers that made me realize I like, hey, I can I can do science on this level. And also a lot of my middle school teachers, um, Auntie Mickey Kopisi and Miss Vieira um, and Mr. Iromora, like they all taught me um, a lot about what science what science is and how to do it, and also how to you know, kind of like go about that realm. And so I want to just give a shout out to them as well. Oh, mahalo. All right. Kukui. Yeah. You make your kumu proud. All of yeah. all of you, really, it's uh, it's so clear. I know that all of your teachers are, can be seen um, through you and and, uh, and are so proud. All right, quick business thing. Uh, yeah, once this, uh, once we get up and over the slope, that'll be, that'll be rock time. <laughs> <laughs> rock clock. Rock o'clock. <laughs> it's rock o'clock, folks. <laughs> yeah, lo there's a whole shout out to the Mega Lab. They just make science mega. It's so fun over at UH Hilo and just doing work around Hawaii, around the Pacific um, with uh, indigenous communities in mind and, and deep technology in mind, but also just focusing on the fun. I like to think we're, we're doing some mega stuff of our own here on oh, board yes. the Nautilus. So uh, super cool. Yeah, we definitely won't forget Rock O'Clock, Val. We've got, <laughs> got it marked. Mm -hmm. I want to contribute just one of my uh, educators. Back when I was in uh, high school, I had a uh, video production teacher uh, over Jerry Reeves. 
and he was just really inspiring and kind of helped uh, set the my for my path forward into film production. Oh, yeah. shout out! Was it was it Miss Reeves? Jerry Reeves, yeah. Oh, Mr. Jerry Reeves. awesome! So cool. Thank you, Amber. Yeah. So lucky. All you great teachers out there listening, I hope you I hope you feel how important you are in the lives of all the learners. Your haumana, yeah. um, your students, you are a source of inspiration and knowledge that, that uh, they are going to carry forward for many, many, many years, regardless of what field they go into. So I love it. I have a, a comment from a viewer that says, one of the things they love about science is that you can be dyslexic and still be good at science. And A.O., actually the, the founder of, uh, of Ocean Exploration Trust, Bob Ballard, legendary Bob Ballard, um, takes a lot of pride in letting people know that he is dyslexic and, and uh, found ways to not just overcome, but use that to his advantage as a, as a great explorer and scientist. And I'm sure some of us in this control van, certainly many of us on the ship, um, uh, have have found ways that um, dyslexia and other things that, that might sometimes be called learning disadvantages have actually um, helped propel our curiosity and, and uh, taken us to, to new places in learning and knowledge. So. Yeah, I mean, that those can definitely be challenging. Like, for example, um, I have ADHD, and uh, it's taken a lot of work to figure out how to, how to uh, use that to my advantage, and you know, some days are better than others, but uh, yeah, it's it actually comes in handy in places like the control van where we're looking at a couple dozen screens. <laughs> so I like I'm getting all this information in at once, and it's great. <laughs> oh, Val can process million, hundreds of millions of years of uh, data, and so it takes a it takes a special mind. We might label mm -hmm. it with things like ADHD, but uh, <laughs> just an indicator of, of yeah. a special mind. Yeah. Yeah, you have to learn how to live with it and. You, you find that some tasks are harder to start or finish than others, uh, sometimes to a pretty extreme level. And uh, sometimes you get really lucky and you figure out what to do with your life that works for your brain. And uh, I got lucky, mm -hmm. kind of fell into this. I love it. I love and it, it works. So for any of uh, those of you with, uh, with you know, ex anywhere on the neurodiversity spectrum where you know whatever challenges you think you're facing or are, are facing um, just know that ocean exploration science technology these fields are for you these communities are definitely for you too we we uh, we need all of the different kinds of brilliant minds that we can get um, mm -hmm. to work on these teams so um, just want to encourage uh, everyone in the van, outside of the van. Mm -hmm. um, I have encouraging myself as well, no matter uh, what challenges we face in learning. Um, we have beautiful minds capable of doing wonderful exploration of this planet, of this ocean. So yeah, and come join the party. Having all these different people, different backgrounds, you know, different different ways of uh, thinking about things and existing. Um, that, that brings so many more perspectives to the table that can really help us figure out a science because sometimes, you know, you got to think up outside of the box and uh, just kind of rethink your paradigms, challenge your paradigms and try to look at them from different angles in order to learn these new things. And that's something that we're constantly doing in science is just interrogating, you know, the things that we accept as pretty standard or uh, uh, always true. And, you know, sometimes those those hold when we challenge them, and it seems like they're correct. But other times, as you get new data coming in, uh, you know, new models that uh, uh, that we develop, sometimes those those uh, those paradigms shift every now and again. And you know, geology is no stranger to that. The with the plate tectonic revolution that happened in the 60s and 70s. What a major shift in understanding that was. It Fundamental. Was, yeah. Changed the whole science basically and overnight. We're still chasing it. We're still chasing this whole new understanding and model of, of how our oceans and planet have formed, how mm -hmm. they're still forming. Um, how they may continue forming in the future, too. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Uh, we need all the beautiful minds uh, to think in all of the ways uh, to help us uh, continue pursuing that puzzle and the many other associated puzzles with living well here on Earth. Mm -hmm. So absolutely, absolutely true. Celebrating neurodiversity and all the different ways that people come into this and all the teachers that have helped us get here. So feel free to pop in any more, drop any more uh, Kumu in here, any teachers who you want to give shout outs to if you're out, out there on the chat. 
um, I'd, I'd love to hear. Some of us in the control van can see those comments and uh, you know, also our, our scientists ashore, mahalo Scott for participating in that. Love, uh, love hearing about all the learning and inspiration and teaching. Awesome, yeah, it looks like we're getting into a new area. We haven't seen that coral, that yellow coral here before. It's kind of interesting. We might see some more up ahead. Yeah, we too. are getting into that. We are in that depth mm -hmm. range. Oh, we're, we're going to see some. What's on the left, actually? We of which, we're going to see some really cool stuff. Yeah, any chance we could take a look at that? I'm not sure if that's actually a white coral or if maybe it's just a. Yeah, the water's just it's, murky yeah. enough that it's washing out it the yellows. It's a little bit yellow and white, which is kind of interesting. Oh, is that hydroid growth? No, it's not. It looks like I am having a hard time. <laughs> like, uh, no, not gonna. Sorry, I shouldn't be laughing that much. <laughs> we might settle into this, but definitely a, a landscape. We're, we're coming up to uh, getting closer within within about 20 or 30 meters of the summit of this sort of local peak um, that we've been climbing up for. That looks like a different coral. Hour. Yeah, that's that's a why I'm having a. Coral. That's why I'm struggling because it looks like honestly there's like three different things that I'm looking at on this, which is really interesting. We heard you liked coral, so we put a coral on your coral. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I appreciate it, but. Uh, <laughs> Looks like a good squat lobster hangout too. Yeah. It is, yeah. Well, cool. maybe I'll tag it squat lobster hangout. <laughs> Sorry for those oh. who are reviewing the footage. You have to deal with my labels. All right, so uh, the uh, scientists ashore, Scott France, and the MVP of the day is suggesting this is actually uh, White, the white tissue is an anthothelid overgrowing the likely acanthogorgid, which explains the struggle of trying to identify this. That is really interesting. Mahalo, Scott. Awesome. All right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the zoom. It's pretty wild. Yeah. I don't think I've seen anything quite like that before. No, you know, and, uh, yeah, it's interesting because I, uh, I thought it might be an Encanthagorgia, but I didn't know that you could have... Oh, look at this big cross-section of a pillow basalt here. Oh. Look at that. <laughs> Rock o'clock, folks. <laughs> Just about. Rocky goodness, yeah? Yes. <laughs> Yeah, so I'll let, I'll let the bridge bring us just past waypoint six. That way, uh, Atalanta can come right up on top of this ridge and then we'll, we'll hold so that we can get a really good look around here. Sounds great. Thank you. Yeah, this is, this is getting, this is kind of exciting. We're, yeah, I think we're, we're seeing the coral bunch. density pick up here. Yeah. And diversity too. We're, this Very is, much so. you know, first glance looks like some paragorgids and, and maybe some chrysogorgids, something. Interesting over there, the white as well. Um, I think we've seen a couple of those, but not many. No, we haven't gotten a zoom on one that I know of either. So if it's possible, that would be awesome. Although it looks like there's a couple other opportunities if, uh, if this isn't a good spot. Can you zoom in? Yeah, quick zoom. Oh. The Atalanta view gives a nice sense of how steep this wall is in front of Hercules. If you want to toggle over to Cam 2, you can see her down below on this uh, summit a... face. Beautiful. That is beautiful. Oh, it's also, got some beautiful really... botryoidal texture on the crusts. Bo oh, sorry, what was that? Uh, yeah, botryoidal. Tell us more about that. It's this kind of bumpy texture that you see. We, wow. we call it, we call those, yeah, we, gotta, uh, we call that a botryoidal. Okay, awesome, here. thanks, yeah. Yeah, yeah let's do it. a little closer with yeah. Atalanta. Yeah, we call that botryoidal texture. It's a little bit of a mouthful, but uh, be total pros at uh, saying that by the end of this cruise. Oh, there's one of those purple oh, corals again. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wow. Look at that. Well, that that's the Plexorid, or no, that's the Victor, Victor Gorgia, or? Yep. Uh, okay, oh, it looks like the Demosponge, wow. too, maybe, and... Uh, Oh wait! What is oh yeah, that looks like the. Victor 
That looks like what we were it. seeing yesterday. Yeah, that, that what? The polyps are massive. Wow. So, is this the plexor we saw yesterday? Is it more like Victor Gorgia? Oh, some worms on there too. Yeah, that's really cool. Awesome. Okay, gotta go. Yeah, great. Yep, Thank let's, you. Let's get a move on. Thank you. That was a beautiful little Whee. spot. Mm -hmm. If you are out there and you're wondering how you can get involved here on the Nautilus in this exploration, there are lots of ways uh, to get involved, both on the ship and on shore. So please have a look at the Nautilus Live website. Uh, the, the education tab shows a lot of opportunities for internships, um, for ways to engage with the crew here, um, emails for contacting, reaching out um, to the organization. And it really is a remarkable team at Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, looking to bring as diverse a crew on board as, as they can. So uh, we uh, encourage you to, to reach out and, and get involved. And well, we love all your questions and comments coming in. Please keep them coming. I think that was another stocked crinoid in the corner there. Bridge now. Starting a little off up here. Looks like we're settling in on, on top or near the top of this local summit. Close to our sixth waypoint of the dive. Yeah. Still very murky waters at this at this level. So the boat, boat is uh, inching forward, and uh, I asked Bridge to come to a stop in about 25 meters. So okay, once we settle in there, we should be able to take a look around. Yeah, I am looking for things that uh, we might be able to pick up. There will be relatively fewer here compared to the slopes, uh, but it looks like we do have uh, some good candidates in, in some little spots here and there. So. That's great. Looks like a lot of sediment collecting on the top of this uh, little local summit here. Oh, mm -hmm. look at this. People are asking about that sort of fast climb we just did. That was really just associated with topography. There was just a steep wall leading up to this local summit. So quick change in elevation and um, had to kind of come quickly up as uh, as the Nautilus and the cable attached to the ROVs is kind of pulling us along. We, we want to make sure we keep up with the ship. So we have to clear the clear that little summit so we can get to the top where we're now at. Big sea star there. Mm -hmm. It's a nice looking pile of rubble. Yeah. <laughs> now, is do you think some of that is loose rubble, or do you think some of that's been sort of encrusted and is actually a part of the? Um, it's probably all going to be encrusted, but mm -hmm. a, a decent amount of it looks loose. Oh, we've got a shrimp there too. Oh, can we? Oh, get sure enough. Hey, little buddy. Yeah, some of it will be glued to the seafloor, but it looks like we have uh, some potential candidates over in that area. I'm a little less sure about that area. It looks like those might be glued. When we say glued, Val, that's the manganese crust that's uh, binding yeah. things together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, these, if uh, you had uh, collapse events or uh, lava flows that uh, fell apart once they cooled pretty soon after emplacement, uh, they've probably been sitting on the seafloor like this now for... Uh, multiple tens of millions of years, yeah. and uh, uh, that's where all the uh, manganese and crustacean has been happening. So it, it, it kind of all uh, grows around these rock pieces, and they grow together. They get stuck to the substrate beneath them, and 
Um, those, we tend not to have a very, uh, we don't have a lot of luck picking those up. So we look for something that um, seems to have come from a nearby rock feature, and uh, but it's not stuck, so we can just uh, go and pick it up. Got it. Thank you. Sometimes you find stuff in the sediment that looks like just these beautiful geology candidates, and they are, but then once you get there and you, you poke at them, you realize that, oh, there's just, there's substrate right under that uh, that sediment. This thing is not moving. We're not gonna so budge. Sometimes it takes a few tries to get a sample. And we, we go with what the seamounts give us. Oh yeah, this looks great. Oh, another shrimpy friend. All right, let's see what we oh, got here. we got here. a shrimp friend too. Yeah. All right. Yeah, these are about the right size too, according to the lasers. This is this is wonderful. So this might be a little bit further out. But that's a candidate. This is a candidate. Um, let's see. Any of these are candidates. And what sample number are we looking at? Uh, that will be number 030. Excellent. Oh, looks movable. Yeah. Oh, it's beautiful. Nice. Beautiful. Are you sure? It looks kind of thin. Well, it looks like there's something in there. Looks like the bottom of it might be lacking some manganese crust, so that definitely looks like an igneous rock to me. Yep, angular, not a pancake, not a potato. That looks awesome. <laughs> All right. Not a pancake, not a potato. Starboard <laughs> side? Yep, we have starboard bio box C, D, E, and F open. So maybe C? All right. Mm -hmm. So you use, you use some technical terms there. Potato, <laughs> pancake. <laughs> Very technical, yes, highly technical. Absolutely, yeah, I love them. The most technical. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. We go to sample mode. Yeah. Like them. Salvo. Uh, Salvo. I, yep, I'll go sample. ahead. Sample. Does it work? Yours doesn't. Oh there yeah, both the guys. Should really work. It does work. And where are we going? D. D. D is in Bravo. Is that correct? Uh, we're doing uh, B or C? C. C as in Charlie. C as in Charlie. Sorry, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Kukui, is that one of our target shrimp that we can see in the field? Um, I don't believe so. Our target okay. shrimp is um, has a more translucent yeah. um, anterior end. Yeah. Gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. I'm looking for that white translucent backside. Mm -hmm. It's also called. Viewers online. Beautiful collection. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, and it's also called the Labias, Labidas shrimp, I think, or something like okay. that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Nav, confirming that was sample zero three zero. Copy right. that. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. All right. Great work. Well, people are curious if there are regions of the ocean where this iron manganese uh, crust does not form. Ooh, I don't know that one off the top of my head. I know I know it occurs across large regions of the Pacific, but uh, yeah, I can go look this up. Oh, okay. I, I don't I don't know the exact answer to this. You know, it's interesting as I don't feel like I I don't think I hear about crust as much in the North Atlantic. Is that? Oh, interesting. Is that just because I'm not paying attention to the North Atlantic, or is that, you know, maybe... Well, if you aren't paying enough attention, you should. I Jeez, probably, I should, really, truly, really, really, yeah. No, it's a good, that's a good question. I'm, yeah, it's I, a little uh, bit out of my area of expertise, but... You move that over something and we can find some info on. Yeah. You know, the other thing, too, is that... Um, uh, you know, just uh, they might just be different thicknesses around as well. I know um, yeah. the Pacific, there's there can be a, um, 
Oh. Maybe more dense or higher concentrations um, right. of these. Let's just say that everywhere I've I've been in the Pacific, where we've done samples, mm -hmm. uh, I have seen manganese growth, and even in some unusual circumstances, uh -oh. I've seen manganese crust starting to form on like rocks that are hung up have erupted within bar. the last couple of centuries. Can yeah. we zoom in with the Argus? Yeah. Or and it does Atlanta look like view? I'm incorrect, and there is ferromanganese oh, crust in the, the Atlantic. However, uh, I want to say it's just about everywhere. The, the crusts get thinner on the younger rocks or rocks that have been broken off of something. Uh, the pilot, uh, I think, you know, uh, more yeah, recently here, than their uh, forms. Say, say we're there. on a 90 million year old seamount right now. Right there, if there was some sort of collapse event 35 million years ago, um, you wouldn't be seeing a whole lot of manganese oh, coat on I those uh, freshly exposed situation. surfaces. Freshly exposed 35 million years ago. But more freshly exposed. <laughs> I, I, think I love it, geologic time. I think time. it's geologic it's time, yeah. It's beautiful. 35 million <laughs> years is still a chunk of change, though. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I'm looking at an image here, and it looks like it's, it, it looks like there is a fairly extensive distribution of manganese and crustacean throughout all of the oceans. I mean, there are obviously some areas where we haven't explored, like portions of the Southern Ocean, where it's just, it, it's, you have that circumpolar current that makes it, uh, uh, kind of wild in that part Difficult of the world so it's waters to navigate yeah it's going to be hard to put an rov down in that so um there, there's some areas where we just don't have in, a lot of information but it looks like yeah manganese forms okay. everywhere it can but there are some zones that are called prime crust zones that are of uh, interest for a few regions too uh, but those are kind of more like equatorial to uh, subtropical range. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, mahalo. And right. thank you for the Stuff. question from the from the viewers. Yeah. This is yeah. It's one of those uh, questions that I don't have a good answer to right off, and that's cool because I get to go learn something new too. We do have another question about sea state right now, about uh, swell height and period. Uh, I don't know. I'm. I've been in the control van now for a few hours, and I can't see a screen that uh, that has it on it. But uh, uh, it looks like that? it's like half a meter or something Less this morning. Than a meter, it yeah. looks pretty beautiful, actually. It looks like there's a nice blue, some yeah. nice beautiful clouds as Although well. Although the storm's throwing up some swells in some different directions this morning, I woke up and was not feeling 100 percent, but oh, yeah, doing, pretty, doing much better nice now. Out there right now. Yeah, pretty nice out here in the waters north of uh, the atolls in Papahanaumokuakea. You know, we're exposed to. Um, all directions. So we have multiple swells running. Uh, prevailing uh, swell is likely coming out of the east due to trade winds and set under a meter and then still pretty small. Not a lot of action in the North Pacific or South Pacific to generate north or south swells. So we're, we're uh, pretty happy, especially any of us who are a little bit prone to seasickness. That's another thing. Uh, just because you get a little bit seasick doesn't mean that, uh, or even a lot seasick, doesn't mean that ocean exploration is not for you. So um, I can vouch for that as someone who gets very seasick without the help of some uh, uh, anti-seasick medication. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, I have uh, several years of experience on vessels, and actually, I've spent um, you know I've I've got a large number of sea days, and I get seasick all the time, regularly. Yeah. Every and just about every every trip I go out on. Um, Unless it's exceptionally calm weather, the first uh, the first couple of days you just feel a little groggy, maybe a headache, um, you know. But but luckily for me, I, I do get over it and I start to That's I good. do start to feel better. Yeah. Just um, want to give a quick shout out to Bonine and Dramamine. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's got their remedies, but mm -hmm. those typically work. Um, you know, mm -hmm. for most people, and we've got people with wristbands and ginger yeah. candies. Oh, I love those ginger Green candies. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's definitely an adjustment period for everybody, I feel. The first couple days at sea, um, mm -hmm. it's true, you know, what they say, you have to get your sea legs, but then once you're out here, I feel like your body can kind of get used to the constant rocking and the movement of the ship. Um, it doesn't stop. It doesn't stop even when we get back into port. I feel yeah, like yeah, that, that is one that of the following that it? evening after we we arrive into port, you still kind of feel a rocking 
but mm -hmm. yeah, we've got a that another is a monster sea star. I think that's the second one of those that we've seen, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Do we Zoom have in. the? Yeah, that'd be awesome. <clears throat> Val, one of our viewers really interested in this uh, ferro manganese crust, um, is wondering if in very uh, old parts of the ocean floor, right near subduction zones, would you be measuring this crust in centimeters rather than in uh, Oh, uh, rather very than in definitely. Millimeters? Yeah, can get pretty thick. Huh? Yeah, I've seen like 10 centimeter thick ferro manganese crusts yeah. on some old seamounts in some other parts of the ocean. It's a lot of glue. It sure <laughs> is. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, I had no idea. Yeah, so it's it's not perfect um, because there are all sorts of other little factors to uh, consider. But if you're seeing if you're seeing like cent a couple of centimeters or more of uh, manganese crust, you know that you're looking at um, a rock that's been there for a while, and that's an early field hint to geologists that uh, uh, we are working on some old seamounts. Yeah which is exactly what we're hoping to look at on this expedition. You know, talking about going deeper earlier and how teachers invite us in, the rocks themselves become teachers because you see them mm -hmm. at first, like when we just sampled mm -hmm. that one, and it gives you some sure. clues as to what it might be, and then we have it on board, and there's a little bit more processing, and you get a better look at it, and you start learning a little bit more, and then Val's down there uh, with the rock sock, slicing them up, and you get a little bit more of a hint, and then we get into the lab where you can do Mm -hmm. really interesting geo you know chemical analysis and uh and you start getting even more layers of of understanding higher precision all this kind of stuff so the and rock has a way of just uh, slowly releasing its secrets yeah it's awesome and then we pair it with other rocks from uh, these other seamounts that we think are related and you can start telling a whole story about the pacific yeah wow. that's really that's really a, a major strand of of uh what val is bringing on board and, and mm -hmm. leading on this expedition is is trying to understand the relationship between these seamounts based on the oh, uh, the geochemistry of the rocks in. there so it's a really oh, yeah, exciting awesome. um playing out over 100 over 100 million years of time wow. but uh, slowly revealing itself to us what do yes. we have here yeah. oh this is cool wow so this is one of these rocks where you don't see a thick ferromanganese crust really any at all. So that was a very timely question from Chad. <laughs> uh, well done, Chad. This rock is actually a traveler. This is not oh. from here. What? Yeah. Wow. We see these here and there on some of these seamounts in the Liliokalani chain. This is pumice. Oh, so this is a rock that was erupted here. out uh, probably at an oceanic uh, or at a, uh, an arc system where you have uh, two plates converging on each other and forming a subduction zone. And you get volcanoes that form in response to that subduction process. And sometimes they have these eruptions that uh, blow out a lot of pumice, which is like very bubbly, very highly aerated, porous uh, uh, kind of rock. And it will actually form these uh, rafts that float on the sea surface. Yeah. And those rafts can travel a long way before the pumice finally gets waterlogged and starts sinking down to the sea floor. So um, we've seen a few examples of this throughout uh, last year, and I think we saw another one earlier today, mm -hmm. uh, where, uh, yeah, it seems like a, a pumice raft sometime in geologically recent history, not necessarily human recent history, <laughs> uh, uh, that got waterlogged in this area of the Pacific and started uh, sinking, sinking these down. large pieces of pumice down. That's cool. interesting. And a couple of us, uh, one of the onshore team and I last year when we figured out we were looking at uh, pumices on the seafloor and that this wasn't like a weird sponge or something, uh, we started looking at some of the maps of the surface currents around the Pacific and figured these might have come from as far away as the Marianas or even the Aleutians. Wow. Oh, wow. Wow. wow yeah. Cool. Far away volcanoes sending little traveling friends. Yeah. You know, we have stories from the voyaging community of uh, sailing through the South Pacific on canoes and encountering these pumice rafts you're talking about, you know, down near Tonga and the oh, Cook really? Islands and down near there. So it's. Yeah, uh, Tonga is another so prodigious cool. producer of on the uh, surface, pumice rafts. We'll see them. Yeah, and then so I was on a dredging you. cruise in the uh, Tuvalu Seamount chain for part of my dissertation uh, 10 years ago, and it's hard to believe it's been 10 years. I remember <laughs> that cruise like it was yesterday. And uh, we we would pull up these pumices occasionally in the dredge bags along with the basalts, and we figured those had to have come from the Tongan arc. Wow. Yeah. Amazing. They look a lot like that rock, too. 
Yeah, pumice. Wow, that's thank you for. I would not have guessed that. We had some viewers wondering: is it bone? Is it you know? Where did this other? Yeah. Uh, but that's a that's a great explanation. And it took us a while to figure out what we were looking at on the last cruise too. We don't think those. of rocks as uh, you, you know voyagers and travelers. To the other but, side uh, of the some of them ridge. are. Yeah. We have a, a tradition. Where are we going? The void. I'm just thinking you want to make a little jump over here. Now yeah. that we've been around here, okay. you guys ready for like a little 50 meter hop and we can Let's check out it. a new area? Sweet. <laughs> Bridge now. We have a tradition in the voyaging community where we'll um, we'll Could take. Could we po uh, move five zero meters at bearing one nine zero? Yep. Thank you. Just being quiet as Catalina does her awesome job of working closely with the bridge. Um, but we have a tradition in the voyaging community of taking kohaku from home, taking stones from home and, and uh, traveling with them as markers um, so that when we enter into new places, we, have a, we leave a piece of home, literally, a piece of kohaku with us. And so uh, people, you know, my bag is usually light. We don't have to pack <laughs> too much to voyage, but it's inside. We're, we're carrying, uh, you know, a handful of stones oh, wow. um, with us. So. Oh, That's you know, cool. you could you could be looking at some stones that were uh, uh, dropped off by voyagers uh, yeah. in, in some distant oh, past. Yeah. It's very possible. <laughs> you know, sometimes we see glacial drop stones up in the Gulf of Alaska too, oh, wow. where the glaciers will, will uh, come south, and uh, as that ice age ends and they melt, they'll leave behind uh, what look like granite drop stones, which stick out quite a bit against uh, basalt. Yeah. So that's. It's, it's always interesting to hear all these different stories of travelers, you know, be they related to uh, uh, human movement or something with the natural environment, like an ice flow or a pumice raft. Yeah. You know, a, lot of, a lot of very similar stories to tell there. And that's, you know, a lot of parallels to draw that yeah. are really neat. Oh, amazing. Yeah. yeah, I've heard a little bit about the, about bringing Pohaku with you on those travels. Yeah, if we're passing, uh, you know, when we're passing the equator, we'll, we'll often have a ceremony when we mm -hmm. uh, are leaving a port that we've just visited uh, for the first time. We kind of mark those memories and those stories and relationships by, uh, and, and the deepest way that you can, by yeah. uh, mm -hmm. sharing some of our million-year-old uh, <laughs> homeland uh, yeah, with, yeah. with the homeland we're visiting. So yeah. oh, it is that's beautiful. so cool. Yeah, I remember sailing over Pico Oaxaca, the equator, last summer, and we had plenty of pohaku on board. Our um, uh, Kealaikahiki leg to voyage from Hilo, Hawaii Island, all the way down to Papayete. And so all around the canoe, there's plenty of pohaku, each from uh, multiple, every crew member will bring a few different ones. And same as when we were sailing up in British Columbia on Hokuda this past summer. But, you know, it is a Polynesian voyaging tradition that's been done for many generations to bring a piece of home with you um, and then leave it. And then, um, as Uncle Bruce says, too, Bruce Blankenfield, one of our kumu, uh, that after, you know, once that pohaku is dropped, once you've been to that place, then you'll be forever connected to that place that you visited mm -hmm. um, through that pohaku, through that stone, through your mana and your ano, your spirit, your po um you know, the power within you. So it's a beautiful tradition. Uh, it is. That has been going on for generations and we're just kind of a continuum of that, that voyaging tradition um. and all of that Ikea too, that knowledge. And as we were all talking about all of the kumu that we've had, all of the teachers uh, that we've had in the past through, deni through many different eras of our education throughout our lives, our adolescence up until adulthood. I think, you know, it's hard to kind of narrow it down to one person because you, if you think of your life in seasons or in geological time, <laughs> like Dr. Val, <laughs> there's just so many people I feel who've influenced us, um, who've empowered us and who've created a safe space for us to be curious and uh, to let our minds kind of wander in this creative realm and think of ourselves as something um, else that we're not at the moment, something that we could po potentially be one day. So a lot of great, um, you know, traditions passed on, a lot of great teachers who've passed on their knowledge in little tidbits here and there. And in retrospect, looking back, we can kind of piece together those moments mm -hmm. and realize how imperative it was and it has been to our growth. Mm. 
Mahalo to them. Mahalo to all of them. You're right, Maina. Yeah. You're right. Mahalo. And to all of these teachers in the deep sea, just uh, continuing to surprise us and delight us and uh, thinking about our forever connections to these sea mounts, you know, mm -hmm. so special. Mm -hmm. um, wow. Oh yeah, that's beautiful. So if we've got uh, the ability to stick around here for a second, this might be a good place to take an eDNA. Yeah. Yeah, right. Kukui just reminded me. I think it's uh, a good idea. Yeah, maybe. we haven't done one in a while. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. eDNA, for those who are maybe new or are unfamiliar with the term, stands for environmental DNA, deoxyribose nucleic acid. Uh, we uh, can find genetic information yeah. that sloughs off living organisms, um, whether it's in their skin tissue or mucus or um, feces or lots of ways we can discard our genetic information and um, sampling the water, uh, we can actually capture so much hey, genetic can you information. Zoom back out? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's so useful for so many different purposes, finding out organisms that you can't see in your field of view. You know, we've, we've only got you know, we've got several meters that we're looking at here in our in our field of view, but uh, you know, it, there's so much more that's hidden, um, and so it can be really useful for for many reasons. Whether you're which one are we doing? Bottle number three. Okay. Now, can you switch the camera over to the Niskin look? You're, uh, those of you what, tuning in live, you're watching uh, Port Rail. the legend, Robert Waters, master ROV pilot, who's been uh, treating us to all these great stops and zooms and, and great to piloting. He's uh, sampling eDNA using our Niskin bottle mechanism here. So he's going to pull one of these triggers. It's going to release one of the Niskins to collect a water sample. We're at uh, just under 1,300 there you meters. Go. Yep. Good. good closure. Great closure. Thank you so much. Robert, you got a shout out in the chat mm -hmm. for all the wonderful piloting you're doing. And it says he's the absolute best. Mm -hmm. uh, he's <laughs> the absolute best. So we agree. Data, just confirming that was sample 0031. Yep. Zero three one. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have time to get a zoom on some of these corals before we have to move over? Yeah. We have a second. Okay. Yeah. I'd be interested in, um, especially uh, on both sides. Yeah. Looking into the that area. One of the one of the key uh, items for eDNA is uh, making sure you also know what what you can actually see to get some some voucher specimen. Um, you know, it's so important to be able to kind of calibrate. You know, what what you're able to get information from, and also you know what what are what are what are complex taxa or what are what are items that are or organisms that are actually more difficult to get from your environmental DNA samples. So. Um, it's a really good point. It's a great, yeah. a great opportunity to collect eDNA when we can identify some of the species in the area. We know the genetic information that ought to be showing up in that sample. Of course, mm -hmm. we won't see everything that's going to show up in that sample, but it kind of validates the methodology and gives us a clue as to how what we're looking at in the eDNA aligns with what we saw. Um, visually yeah exactly visually. And, yeah. and the more we know about that the, the the broader the scale we can use it to uh, you know I look into larger patterns and, and such especially for managing large areas like this awesome yeah. what, do what do we see what do we not see that mm -hmm. shows up in the eDNA Like there's a little sponge action happening next to uh, the hold fast for this uh, coral. Oh, fine. Oh, interesting. It also looks like it's. Uh... Wild. 
Actually, you can see some of its skeleton is yeah. over there too. That's interesting. Yeah. And you're right, there's a sponge there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I don't know what that is. Mm -hmm. See some little spicules on it. Yeah, yeah that's great. Mm. It might be a, like a really young patella, possibly a rosella. Sorry? It might be a. Um, Plectelid or a really young rosellid, um, unstocked. Oh. Yeah. Or it could be eventually stocked, but uh, yeah, I don't know how those, what those um, life stages look like. Yeah, to me it looks like it's an unstocked sponge. Um, yeah, I don't see a stock on that. Mm -hmm. Very cool. That was a nice zoom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Oh wow, yeah, this is a beautiful area too. Mm -hmm. A little bit more sedimented over here, which may have something to do with the lower population density, kind of overall. Mm -hmm. It'd be awesome to get a zoom on this one as well as either one of those, okay. either of these three. Now right in the middle of this sort of local summit, this local peak on the Loudoun Seamount, and just uh, cataloging some of the biodiversity in this benthic zone on the seafloor here. The buried shrimp. Yeah, and that's one of our other target shrimps, or our only target shrimp, I should say. Oh yeah. But she's buried though. Yeah, and Vir Virginia pointed out a really good uh, point of the shrimp is we, we see some purple in here, so. Yeah, yeah right there, right? Yeah. 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 Very be mama. Mama. Yeah, mm -hmm. brooding mama. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. That's a wonderful zoom, thank you. It's one of the things I, I really respect and admire about our science team here is um, so careful to enter into this environment with so much respect and aloha mm -hmm. um, and care, uh, making sure that we're only sampling things that are that are uh, gifted to us by this place and revealed to us by this place and following all of the um, boundaries set by the, the permit that we operate under and actually usually taking much less than, than what the science team is, uh, is even permitted to take so yeah i mean we try to take only what we need to do the science that's right yeah mm -hmm. on, a, on a very different subject uh <laughs> we were lifting off there i was looking at the right end of the screen and i'm like what is that that is so weird then i realized i was looking at part of the manipulator oh. <laughs> <laughs> what is this strange creature that's us that's us well. it's just a moment of wait what is that that's our robot. Uh, you wanted to look at these other ones over here yeah either Either of these um, right. would be interesting. That looks like we've got a very a large crinoid, yeah. probably, that yeah, there, yeah. too. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think I'm seeing what looks like some old holdfasts on the uh, in the upper left corner, too. <clears throat> Or some, or some of those white corals. It's a little hard to tell. Yeah, it is hard to tell. Actually, yeah, they're they're white corals. Never mind. Oh, wonderful. Ooh, that's a beautiful shot on the silk cam. Mm -hmm. uh, ooh, that's a good one.
Oh, that's a beautiful zoom. It is. Remind me again, Val, what's the, the bumpy texture on the rocks? Had a name. Are you, are you yeah, sure uh, it's, that's patrioidal texture. Patrioidal. Patrioidal. Oh, that's fantastic, yeah. And then over Riddle here, stuff. we have one of our, uh, maybe another nudibranch, oh, or wow. some sort of holothurian. Oh, whoa. Oh, good spot. Good spot. Good spot. It's got some yeah. tentacles on it. I'm <laughs> going to really go does. with another sea cucumber. You can see it's guts. <laughs> yeah. Sediment in the tip. Oh, wow. That's mm. cool. Some of those tentacles are longer than its body. Yeah. I think so. <laughs> yeah, wow. That's wonderful. Reminds me of a large glow worm. Have you ever been down in the caves in New Zealand, Aotearoa, in the dark oh, caves? I haven't yeah. been and I want to. Is that on there. the North Island or the South Island? Uh, both, both, yeah, okay. but there's some popular spots in uh, Waitomo is a popular spot yeah. to go into the caves. That's the North Island. I love New Zealand. I've yeah. been to the North Island before, uh, checking out some of the old uh, eruption deposits from Taupo. Yeah. Mm. Oh, Such Taupo's a beautiful, beautiful. country. I haven't been to the South Island yet, and I know that has some really spectacular mountains. Such a beautiful country, and it's just the south oh, side of great. the country we're currently in. That's we're just on the north it. end of uh, like Pacific Island rigid. peoples, and Aotearoa, our cousins, our Maori cousins down kind to the of. south, make up another corner of what's known to some as Polynesia, but those lines were drawn well after the Pacific peoples had populated the entire, the entire ocean. Amazing. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Oh, Thank, beautiful you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Shall we move along, or is there anything else you wanted to see? No, I think we've seen several of the. We've gotten some good zooms of the immediate. Okay. Taxa. Um, awesome. That's great. So we ready to get going? I All think good? so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Let's see. Let's move. Yeah, so we're going to start heading down slope again. I'll get him to just track a line in that direction. Let's cruise. That's a good one for to, for folks on the internet to learn from Kukui. Mahalo for that. Holo holo kako. Holo holo kako. Let's go. Let's cruise. I love it. Let's go to waypoint seven. Mm -hmm. uh, Bridge, could we um, track a line at bearing 185? at 0 0.3 knots. Yeah, it's a, it's a first line from one of my favorite mele or song. Thank you. Um, written for Mo'olele. Um, she was our first uh, double hull sailing canoe based off of Lahaina Maui. Um, she's in the realm of Po now, um, sailing probably with uh, Papa Mo right now. Hey, oh, All right. So, yeah. This reminded me of that. Yeah. Um, Molele uh, transitioned into Po in the recent fires in Lahaina, and uh, mm -hmm. we're, we're glad she's sailing in these waters with us. Yeah. Um, what an incredible va'a, what an incredible canoe. Mm -hmm. uh, taught so many people how to, how to sail on these waters around Hawaii. Yeah, a couple of anthemastas here. Yeah, these little mushroom corals. This, these ones don't have quite the stalk as the others. I wonder if that makes it the uh, pseudoanthemastus. Zoom in. That's interesting. Yeah, we can get a quick zoom on that. Mm -hmm. And we'll get, then we'll uh, continue with the move. Yeah, sounds great. Oh, this one's, is it missing a couple polyps? Yeah, it looks like it. I wonder what or happened. Or are they just... Is, oh, that, a, yeah. is that a nudie brink to the, to the right of it, or is that yeah. a... Oh, that looks like a sponge, actually. Oh, it's a yeah. sponge growing. I think, yeah. I think so. Yeah, oh, it's hard cool. to tell. Those could be retracted, maybe, but... Yeah. That's a good question. Interesting. Or maybe it's growing new polyps. You Don't know, it know. looks like some of the polyps are different sizes, too. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. I am unfamiliar with... Anthemastis uh, growth and it was really cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so we are uh, we are continuing up this slope. We've been uh, on our dive. We've moved from about what 1,500 meters to now we're at 1,300. Just uh, yeah, we started at about 2,200. Oh, sorry. I meant uh, I did say dive. On our watch, I did yeah. say dive. I uh, I meant shift. Ah, uh, okay. Yep. Uh, that is, you know, it's the difference between brain to mouth. Yeah. <laughs> it happens. I think yeah. we're about to pass over another little saddle, right? We'll have kind of a little dip. Yep. In, yeah, uh, I think so. We'll yeah, we'll see what we see there. Mm -hmm. We're on the top of this little summit, this flat little mini, mini peak. Yeah. And there will be a, a little bit of a dip, and then we'll climb back up to waypoint seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's been pretty wonderful. I know at the beginning of this dive at uh, 2,200 meters, there was there. They said that there was quite a lot of sediment, and now we've we've definitely moved into a um, you know these this boulder area, which is or what would you call this uh, this the type of how would you describe the uh, rocks and hard pan shapes that we're seeing? Uh, those look like uh, potentially some uh, lobate lava flows. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Forming some, uh, some pillow structures as mm -hmm. well. All right, so we have an ID from uh, Tina in the science chat that uh, that mushroom coral looking thing is probably a pseudo-anthemastus. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. There are about 20 minutes left in the 8 to 12 watch here on Man, Hawaii Man, already? Time. I know. <laughs> okay. But uh, stay tuned. The 12 to 4 watch is always amazing, and I think uh, they're going to be in for a treat. I'm, I'm predicting a lot of life. Yellow stock. Oh, oh yeah, another hours. yellow stock oh, cool. crinoid. That's wonderful. Yeah, it's gonna be hard to get down in here. It's kind of, yeah, I can't. And I no might have to fly the saddle, huh? All right, that's okay. If if we need to fly, let's fly. Uh, it wasn't. It was just. It was down in a hole. I couldn't. Ah, uh, yeah, in there. yeah. That's interesting. Ooh, he's cruising. Feels like the water is even murkier here than it was uh, further down slope. That's an interesting coral. Yeah, bridge. I don't no? think we've seen the one that looks quite like that recently. You zoom in. Is that another primnoid of uh, some sort? It's looking like Pelicopchopter. Yeah. Mm, oh, we know. Oh, yeah, that's so beautiful. On both sides. Look at all of the associates on it. Oh, wow, yeah. Oh, that's, there's plenty. Stop crab. Yeah. With a little stolen imprint in the back, maybe? Oh, that's beautiful. Mm. Oh, and what is that? Oh, it's an anemone. Yeah. Yeah, these are some beautiful primnoids and crustaceans with the uh, crustaceans and brittle stars on them. It's a good hangout spot. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's a large holdfast too. Yes, that is a impressive holdfast. The sponge that's just to the left, what we saw one earlier that I thought Look, I was like quickly thought it might have looked like a nudie. What's the ID on that sponge? Do we know that guy right there? Um, which sponge? Is that is that a sponge there? That might be a green thing. A, oh, oh a green a thing. Old <laughs> old fast maybe. An old. It's, it's hard. It's yeah, hard to tell. It could be I'd that say. too. Oh, yeah. it's an old. Oh, okay. Look at you guys. Thanks for helping me out. Atlanta's going to start getting ahead of it. Well, we are. Okay, right. great. Ahead. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. good time to move on. All right. Beautiful coral. Yes. Nice yeah. zoom.
Still another uh, 10 hours or so left in this dive. Might even be a little more than that. So you can stay with us through a couple more watches. Uh, we might get to bring the bring the ROV back up Seems later like tonight, which would be mm -hmm. a lot of fun. You can join us for our wacky conversation. <laughs> uh, oh, a jelly. Oops, oh. Something just went beep. Going down slope. Oh, interesting. So we are flying over this uh, saddle point, and then we'll settle back down a little bit and start moving up slope again toward the next waypoint. Oh, all the secrets of what was on the saddle. We're going to miss it. That's OK. You can't, you can't see it all. It is good. <laughs> there will be plenty more saddle points to explore this place, So <laughs> That's true. Probably even still a couple on this dive from the looks of the uh, the profile yeah, we're going up. It's a great profile. What a contour. Huh? We're, we're kind of yeah. all these little peaks along the way. It's like hiking up a ridge on the Hawaiian Islands. It's a lot like exactly, that. Exactly, so yeah. I love it. I love it. It's like being back home. Oh. Well, we had a question come in earlier that uh, uh, we were focused on the biology at the time, but I was really, came in from one of our online viewers, but it's asking about um, the chemical properties of the ferromanganese and, and what uh, what allows it to form that glue-like bond. I don't know, you know, how how much you've uh, paid attention to the chemical properties of that ferromanganese, but uh, um, what? so it's not like actually glue in the sense that we think of it. All I right, just kind of right. use that as just a casual term. The effect it has a yeah, glue it, effect. Yeah, it's because you have uh, uh, the stuff um, basically depositing. Uh, out of the water, so uh, it's it's like a chemo sedimentary feature, yeah. um, and once you just get uh, enough of that stuff built up on the outsides of uh, rocks, uh, if uh, the continuity of that uh, that crustal growth from uh, rock to substrate that it may be sitting on, just means that it's really hard to move. Yeah. It's, it it's the stuff is brittle, but it's also fairly strong. Most types of it. It's kind and, of like uh, a rust in a way. Yeah. Yeah. Kind of. Oh, and it's kind of ground here. It, yeah. it, it can make things uh, just stick because it's just thicker than uh, we're able to, uh, to break. We can't overcome the strength of uh, thick ferromanganese uh, crusts with the manipulator very well. Sure. So it's it's just much easier to uh, tr try to get a loose fragment of rock. Okay, interesting. Yeah. And the, I've heard you describe um, the process as, as nucleate that first sort of attaches um, this, this uh, ferromanganese, the mm -hmm. iron, to the... Um, to whatever it's sort of coating. Zoom on this yeah. fish um, what's that here? process mean? What's it, what does it mean to nucleate on? Um, so it's it's a little bit like that uh, Mentos and Coke thing that was a really big uh, that, that went Love viral that a number of years ago. Yeah. <laughs> so same sort of principle there. It's it has to do with the roughness of um, of a surface, and sometimes with the right surface roughness that can cause uh, you know that that basically acts as a place where things dissolved. Yeah. In, yeah. a, in a liquid can start to accumulate. Yep. And with the, the Mentos and Coke idea, it's, uh, there's there's actually like microscopic level roughness on the candy shell of, uh, of a Mentos. Yeah. And uh, that actually makes it possible for um, the CO2 dissolved in, uh, uh, dissolved in the Coke, which is what gives it that, that bubbliness when you yeah. drink it. Yeah, that carbonation. Yeah, yeah. It, it causes that, uh, uh, those, those rough spots give, uh, uh, basically trigger Keep a way to uh, Attach, form bubbles yeah. and then the, it can rather explosively uh, degas <laughs> your pop. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love this, uh, you know, the talking about these surface textures and, you know, I, I mentioned biomimicry earlier where so many things in the marine environment have specially adapted surface textures to uh, the living things to, so that they can avoid having other things attached to them or Mm -hmm. um, you know. Sometimes chemical deterrence, yeah. and chemical bad deterrence taste, or a toxin, or something. Yeah, 
Like an amenities are pretty still pretty three story building. things. <laughs> yeah, they are. <laughs> Thank you for that. So as you can see, we're back on bottom now after uh, uh, navigating a little bit of a drop off, uh, moving south of waypoint six here. So we're uh, gonna, uh, the, the ship's right over the saddle point of this feature here, and the ROV is trailing a little bit. So, Herc is about to come over a relatively flat area, and we'll see what we see there. And then, and then we'll start going up a uh, up a slope again. Um, it's going to be more gradual than uh, the one that we just went up in order to reach waypoint six. Mm -hmm. And I have no idea what we're going to find. I know, it's exciting. <laughs> only Kamala knows. Yep, looks like we've got another sea We only get to know it when we get there. Yeah, awesome, thank you. Looks like three different corals here. There are three different corals, and they've got it's like a Chrysi Gorget, a Hemicorallium, and a Perigorget. That's wonderful. And, and either uh, a sponge or a sea cucumber, probably a sponge. Wonderful. Yeah. We're starting to see some of these, some more of these crevice filling sponges. That's what those are, yeah. Wow, that's wonderful. Is this full zoom? It is, yes. Excellent. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Is this coral bent at 90 degrees on the bottom there? Uh, it could be. It. Um, it could be that it attached and then it grew upwards. Yeah. There's also the chance that maybe the cobble shifted. And it was able to um, continue. That's interesting. Yeah. All right. That's wonderful. Oh, another fishy friend. Oh, Ooh. oh that wow. Shark? That's hey, wonderful. Buddy. Oh. That is. Zoom in. Wow. It oh, does look, look like a shark. Look at that tail. And the, wow, the that very is. flat nose of it, too. Yeah. That's interesting. Come back, friend. Oh, pretty okay. quick. Yeah. A little yeah. skittish. Nice That's quick. okay. Yeah. Yeah. Camera shy. <laughs> oh, yeah. We're seeing more of those. Uh, sponge over there. The Actually, it looks like a lot of those assemblages yeah. of the Chrysogorgid, Paragorgid, and, and Corallids continuing. And oh yeah, we haven't seen one of those um, sponges. Well, during our section of this dive, I don't think we've seen one of these. Yeah. I believe it's I a bacteria. Crinoids and a squat lobster. Ooh. Yeah. Okay, one crinoid. That's a different uh, coral at the base there. Yeah, it looks like the another paragorgid. They are so those paragorgids are so brilliant red. Oh, Ooh, there squat lobsters running for it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm out of here. I don't blame it. You got this big scary thing that probably looks a little like a predator coming through. <laughs> nah. if, if they can even register just how much light we're shining. Yeah. Oh, that is wonderful. Yeah. That's a beautiful view of that crinoid and that welt. I think Walterius. I think you're right, Walterius sponge. Cool. Oh, that's a beautiful silk cam shot too. Yeah. Wow, look at that. Yeah. Wow. Mm. That is awesome. Oh, you can see it's got a couple of small organisms on its side and inside of it. It's one of the many reasons why these sponges can be so important. Is they can create habitat alive when they're alive as well as when they're dead, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, yep, Asako confirms Walteria sponge, and then uh, the coral is a Paragorgia. Nice. Mahalo, Asako. Yeah, thank you. Mahalo, Asako. All right. All right. Looks good. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, uh, it's always exciting to see some of these these changes in uh, in topography and and uh, you know the size of the substrate can be really important. So here we're seeing a lot of uh, small boulders and such. Um, which... Any small boulders the size of a large boulder? <laughs> I don't know if you ever saw that tweet, but it's been a classic in the geology space ever since. Oh, you know, I I, uh, I have not. Actually. <laughs> I'll have to show that to you yeah. later. I'm hoping it still exists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a. Uh, uh, road out west that have been uh, blocked off by a uh, pretty decently sized boulder that fell off of uh, an outcrop and they 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 just had this little type of like large you know uh, xxy road is closed because of a small boulder the size of a large boulder or something like that <laughs> and for, geology's just run with it ever since <laughs> wonderful as they should yep Yes, that's excellent. Another good headline during the 2018 Kilauea eruption that went viral was, uh, oh my gosh, what was the headline? They were worried about some explosive activity that was going to blow some uh, blocks potentially out of the caldera. We we're reporting on that for safety reasons. And uh, yeah, I think I think there was somebody missed oh, something during like editing and called that had the headline as... Uh, uh, block, like fridge sized refrigerators flying out of the caldera. And <laughs> <laughs> just the mental image of a fridge sized refrigerator flying out of a volcano just got me. Oh, gosh. <laughs> anyway, That's back fun. to business. Um, we have a stocked sponge here. So yes. we've seen a couple of these. This might be one of the taller ones that we've encountered. Yeah. Can so it does in? look like it's coming from the bottom, which someone mentioned was indicative of uh, bolosomas earlier. Yeah. This has yeah. A Oh wow, that is stunning. Not to rush this view, but as soon as we're done here, we're going to want to get back ahead of Atalanta. Okay. I'll go here. Oh, yeah. All right. Alien out. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thank you. We have the uh, next watch starting to trickle in here, so we're going to start coming in and out over the next five, six minutes uh, as we uh, turn over uh, and uh, brief everybody on what happened during this watch, get them set up for the next one. Hey. Wow. Yeah, it's been this a real pleasure. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's been fast. awesome. Sure did go by fast. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, 8 to 12. Thank you, pilots. Yes. Yeah, awesome absolutely. Awesome navigation. And thanks oh, to everyone who uh, interacted. It's been actually. great to, <laughs> to interact with everyone as well. So, um, absolutely. To everybody online, our scientists ashore, our viewers on, uh, on YouTube and Nautilus Live, we appreciate you. And uh, enjoy the, the madness of a watch change. And uh, we will keep exploring. We'll be on for at least another 10 hours or so. So stay with us today. Um, try to get a little bit of work it's done better. maybe, but It's better, otherwise. but I think, like well, now we don't have everyone. as much poop. Ahoy ho, until we meet again. Thank you so much. Yeah. 
But uh, yeah, we are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, so the currents have dropped way down. Yeah. 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 What? Yeah, you're not changing my uh, 20 years of manipulating by trying to talk me into that. <laughs> I think it's I think it's you. Yeah. Come up and look down. Or look down and come up. Stumped about me. Yet. Please. Please stomp the boat. Mm. 
I should have uh, I should have done that when I came in five minutes ago. Test, test, SPL. Come on, people, focus. We don't worry about comms and all that stuff later after we figure out what's going on in front of us. What's happening with the boat? Where's the wall? What's the bathy? I'm not, a, I don't need to answer. You need you, you to be aware. I feel like you're not. Things happen at watch change when we boats moving and we're up against the wall. Trust me. Roger. come in, the first thing I look at is the vessel speed and the position of the RVs, and uh, Robert was 20 meters out of the box on the backside, so Atlanta was shallower up against the wall, and he was trying to catch up. We, he was just coming down through a dip, and then the uh, wall's coming up on the other side, but you could see it coming there. And yeah, so <coughs> uh, w uh, my bad, I should have stopped the boat right away. But so as we're going back up the saddle, the boat's still moving, Atlanta's still swinging, so we don't have any time to, you know, stop and look at it, which is unfortunate. And that five minutes, ten minutes there that we spent talking about what we did four hours ago and worrying about uh, other things has cost us some really nice uh, imagery here on the wall, so I have to keep moving. And he's also got the manipulator hanging out, so where's that too? So Didn't we just had our that. That could have been tragic. watch change. Um, hello, everyone who's tuned in. It sounds like ROV operations. He's got the manipulator hanging out as well. Are just getting used to what um, our current position is. So we'll hop on and chat more in a second after ROV gets um, everything in order. <coughs> I'll be situated, but I have to. Uh, I have to whine a little bit here. The watch change should be. Uh, you know, five minutes and pertinent, not a ten-minute uh, social conversation. We missed some really nice terrain there because that was a you know, ten-minute handover. <coughs> I can uh, request of the other watches to stop the ship ten minutes early. It takes about 10 minutes for Adelanta to swing in, which is usually what we do, just to avoid that situation. But be aware when you come in here, you know, things don't, things are dynamic. They don't stop. Okay, and rant. Uh, can we have a look at that purple colony? Turn your volume up. Turn your main volume up. Uh, I also cannot hear you back here, Dan. Mm -hmm. That would be Victor Gorgia. Well, you'll have to get video to sort it out. Mm -hmm. 
Can you zoom in there, please? Come on. That looked like a uh, Victor Gorgia with uh, Ophiroids in it. That's a beautiful purple color me. See some bubblegum corals. It can come up uh, by if they... It's uh, gonna get probably close again. The difference now is the boat stops, so... Or Atlanta, I should say, seems to. This is a chrysogorget in the center. Move north, 25 meters, please. 25 north, yeah. Let's try this again. Bridge control. <laughs> they probably st <laughs> There's the captain on the bridge. We have the captain on our watch. Quite different from our last watch, some 800 meters further down than our current depth. Yep. And just a little update, if you're just tuning in, we are currently on Loudoun Seamount, which is an extinct summer Come down volcano. Five. Roger. Mm. 
I'm going to go into auto XY for a minute. This C mount consists of two distinct flat topped features that have a summit at a depth of about 800 meters. And um, we have dove this C mount before, but on a different side. Once again, we're in a place that hasn't been seen before. Yeah. And in this very uh, sacred space, Papa Hanamo Kuakea, Marine National Monument. Can uh, Iris up a bit, please? Down lights are annoying. And if no one dives this spot in the future, oh, you're good. Wait it for won't the be boat. seen again live. <laughs> for but a it'll, while. Be, it'll be archived and recorded. Mm -hmm. Always accessible. No, I said we're waiting for the boat. Hey Hans, would you uh, be cool if I added the uh, stills cam to your computer? Since we're waiting for the boat to catch yeah. up, can we awesome. zoom on on a couple Come. of things? Yep, let's watch your altitude there. So you're on the shallow side again? Yeah. So this is where we kind of picked up at watch change, only, um, you know, the boat was moving the other way. Sorry, what did you want to zoom on there? Uh, Anything? The crinoid, yeah, the crinoid on the paragord here. It seems like a very strange shadow, like the yeah. lights have moved. Sorry. Zoom in a bit there. Zoom in. in. Is this something at the base of the bubblegum coral? Looks like a chitin. Yeah. Is it possible to zoom in on it a little bit more? Yeah, that looks like a chitin. That would be the second mm. one on our watch. This is the cockroach-like thing, Mia, that you were pointing out the other day. What? Mm -hmm. So I'm used to seeing that, you know, harder shell exterior, but yeah. what is that on top of? Is that? Ex I can't understand that. Initially, I thought that's the base of the coral, but that's not. Mm. Interesting. I'll write that down. Is that? remnant of a sponge. Right. Is it a you can see ophiroid arms. Yeah, we're on the cliff, so it's gonna wander around. So Now we can move on from this. Okay, can go away. Thanks for pointing that out. Sorry, I was working down here, so I had you guys turned off. <laughs> That's fine. Do you have your stick? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I do have my stick. Good. So, yeah, so as Dr. French points out in the chat that that was indeed a chitin with a very large hood and it was a predatory chitin as well. Predatory was uh, eating something? Uh, or it's a type of no, chitin that predates. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. Mm 
And just to clarify for our listeners, um, we are connected to a whole uh, network of scientists that help us identify things and um, answer questions and do their research from ashore. Uh, so it is really an amazing community of deep sea researchers. Yes, the topography has changed a lot since our last watch. It's a pretty interesting texture on mm -hmm. covering on the surface of the rocks. Are we supposed to collect a rock from this area, or do we have enough rock samples for up, now? We get up past uh, 1,200, 1,100 meters. We'll take another sample. Okay. Just chatted with Val on the way out. Okay. Watch shift. Uh, so I have no midlights. Hmm. Yeah, it was looking pretty dark in the still cam too. Yeah, I'm missing uh, one of the light circuits is wonky on holiday. I'll see. Um, Do you want to do a gauge check, Manny? Yeah, uh, uh, tell me what the humidity in, in the bottle is there. So that means we're going to have to suffer with the down lights. Uh, they'll give us light, but they look, you see all that, they highlight all the, uh, the, yeah, the marine snow, thank you. Just very annoying, but at least you can see where you're going. Um, ROV team, are we good for doing um, just a, a very quick set of introductions for our new watch? We'll just go around and say our names and our role. I think we're still still needing some time. We okay. need some time, yeah. No problem. Just let us know when you're ready. That conversation was longer than. I'm Dan. I'm sitting in the hurt chair. <laughs> <laughs> Dan, you're famous. All the our all of our viewers <laughs> already know Dan, the famous ROV pilot. Famous yeah. <laughs> ROV operator. And I'm Mia, the navigator. Yes, Mia, the navigator, but also oh, sea so. star yeah. spotter. Yeah. spotter. <laughs> I thought a special I, role of a sea star spotter. I thought I saw a moat for busy, so I didn't want to point it out. <laughs> <laughs> we see some two anthomasses or pseudo anthomasses colonies on the rock towards our right. I think I saw a shrimp swimming by earlier. There are definitely. Ooh. Is what a is that? Predatory tunicate? Yeah. I think maybe. Maybe you're one of the solitary. No, it's not a solitary hydrosome. Voracious predator. Deep. Yeah, it looks more like a predatory. Zoom in, yeah, it's a predatory. Zoom in, tunicate. That's far, Dan. It is a tunicate for sure. Uh, Kara, when did. Asking about tunicates good, last good. time? Yes, there was a viewer asking yeah. about tunicates, so this is so amazing. This, exactly. <laughs> Hopefully they are on. Yeah, <laughs> yes, and they're they will turn in later and that see That is it. a beautiful view of, uh, of the tunicate. Our tunicate fan, I hope you're watching out there. Yes, I they, don't think they I did. have seen this kind before. I believe they call themselves okay, tunicate. Push in a bit more. Uh, day. That's <laughs> the family. I will look that up. That's good, thanks. Looks like he has a crown. I know, I was wondering about that. I'm going to push in a bit more on the top side there. Octo, yeah. That's all you Octo got, is it? Day. Yep, that's That's the family, and we have probable genus as well, but 
the internet on our computers are running a little slow. Mm -hmm. So. So those are the organs that we're seeing there. Those are the internal organs? Uh, it looks like gonads to me. I don't know, though. Yes. That would be my guess, too, having um, done some stuff with tunicates. But shallow water tunicates, we could see their kind of internal digestive organs. But again, the deep sea is crazy, so. <laughs> are you full of tuna yet? Yeah, so this looks like the genus uh, Megalodicopia. Uh, sorry, the internet here is a little slow, so it took me a while to catch up. No, that's beautiful. We're good? Mm -hmm. We are good. Okay. I don't know if we can frame it up in the still cam. It might be a little dark still. Yeah, it's probably a little dark for the still cam. But I hope our Tunicate fan from last night is watching. Yes, Because they, they were very excited about <laughs> seeing yes. a deep Hans sea. Hans has a new toy back there. Yes, Tunicate fan sent us a comment yeah. saying <laughs> they're here. You so. wait, uh, Hans, uh, yep. pro tip, if you wait till the ROV is uh, not moving or moving oh. as now much. You yeah, yeah, now it's coming up in the... Roger. Uh, when, when the vehicle's moving, because, uh, you know, the... the camera's slow because it's low light, you'll get a fuzzy picture, but if you... Uh, Wait till we yeah. Get so it in frame. I'll, I'll purposely try not to, you know, be. Okay. Yeah, I'm quite Sometimes sure. you only get a second or two, but and they're free, so that you can click as much as you want. Still, yeah. And the outer edges will be. Uh, oh, there's a word for it. It escapes me at the moment. Vigenet. <laughs> so a lot of the images are. Uh, Post-processed, they're cropped, they're zoomed in and cropped. Okay, we've got a few attempts there. We're good. All right. And then you can look in that folder, mm -hmm. and you can uh, open up the JPEG and see what you got if you're curious. That's good. Oh, it's it's competition quality. <laughs> uh, each one takes two pictures. There's a a raw picture and a JPEG, so the raw, I don't believe, will open on that machine. Yeah, the raw, uh, picture, the raw file won't open. Uh, but uh, JPEG will. Mm -hmm. So the raw files are the obviously the... The higher resolution. Ones. Yeah. <coughs> but oh. if the JPEG is of that quality, I'm sure the... Uh, the JPEG is just, yeah, so yeah. you can see what you're getting. Yeah. The raws are, uh, Megan post-processes them on, the, on her fancy Mac there in the studio. Okay, we got something to work with. Oh, interesting. I see that one of the common names for the tuna kit is a ghost fish. Is it? I I never heard of that. Have you heard of? It's called what? A ghost fish. Oh. Oh, I didn't. That's new. It's interesting. Looks Cage like check check. Beautiful iridogorgia. Right, those can numbers now. Spot another crinoid on uh, bubblegum coral, and the white colony towards the left is probably a stylasterid. That would be a hydrozone. I'm sorry, I stand corrected. Sea squirt. Yes, yeah, <laughs> sea totally squirt. Different. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> They are eurocordata, eurocordates. Yeah, so the interesting thing about tunicates, right, they're eurocordata, that's the group they're in, so they're actually um, out Cordates. of invertebrates. Yeah. yeah, they're closest to humans compared to something like a snail or um, a uh, jellyfish. jellyfish. That is what uh, yeah. probably can be mistaken. Yeah, because before. when they're at their larval stage, they actually do have something similar to a spine. Um, and they can swim around, and once they find somewhere they want to attach, they actually dissolve the, that, those neural uh, neurons, um, and then just become yeah, sessile. Mm. 
And yeah. the, these predatory tunicates are especially interesting because they're predatory. They kind of look like a sock puppet to me. Um, whereas other ones like sea squirts, they're more filter feeders. So they're bringing in water into their body, filtering out the nutrients and plankton and stuff inside, and then putting that water back out. What's that? Controlship Colin. There's a interesting fish there. Oh, I do see that. Yes. I see that it. some way Macriurid again. You're fine, you're fine. You're good, you're good. Okay, yeah. so do you have a little bit more information on the chitin that we were uh, Right now I'm getting uh, my yeah. uh, so Dr. Friend cliff back. Had, have posted a link uh, to a Some paper in the chat Aussian and it talks about back down the hill. a new species of the genus Placiforella where with Robert. Uh, what we were thinking as a piece of rock or a dead sponge on which the chitin was uh, sitting on is actually part of the chitin itself if we look at the images. Do as I say, not as I do. Yeah. Placiforella laurier compared. <coughs> Technical text, not social text. To our resident ROV engineer. Distribution kind of matches up with the depths that we are in a little further in the geographic extent, but so this chitin is somewhere a little bit further than where we've seen it before. Uh, in the in the paper describing it, the first records from oh, cool, we're more. Uh, west, no, more east from us. East, yes. And one more story for our tunicate fan out there. Um, when I was working as a marine science educator, mm -hmm. um, we would often be showing uh, students different marine organisms, especially invertebrates, like sea squirts. And um, whenever we were showing them a sea squirt, I would tell them, like, all right, gather around real close. What is this? Like, get closer, take a good look, and then <laughs> it would squirt out that water into their faces. It was a <laughs> it was a fun lab. Push in there a little video, halfway. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's good enough. Oh, we are back to the to where the tunic it was. Yeah, that's the anthomastis. Yeah, I'm just gonna. Uh, I'm going to cover some ground here that mm -hmm. we didn't, hopefully. Okay, Absolutely. go ahead. Sounds good. And then just slide along the <coughs> bottom of the when cliff here and darker, come up I in a different area. Else, a little slower. That's because I'm forced to wear a muzzle. <coughs> I have to put the microphone literally on the... Uh, I tend to mumble. I think there's a sea star Find it out. <laughs> now we're busy, I think. Okay. Sure. Uh, you have